Um, so really quick, my name is Tim. Um, Instagram is Bobby Bags. That was my uh, pre-legalization name, Bobby. So um, kind of kept that for the Instagram handle. Um, so I'm a father. I have a two-year-old at home. Um, I'm the co-founder of Fave and Under Canopy Company. Um, I have 15 years cultivation experience and 10 of those at scale. Um, in 2016, California went legal and things got, things got a little weird, right? The market kind of bottomed out, prices dropped. Um, so I actually stopped growing weed for two years and I went back to school um, and I attended uh, the College of Ag at UC Davis. Um, after college, I kind of had a decision to go work not in cannabis and it just like I just couldn't I couldn't do it so I had to go back into cannabis um, I actually kind of uh, got really lucky and teamed up with uh, connected and alien labs there in Sacramento um, so I ran their R&D facility for uh, about 10 months there before I got moved to another facility um, and there's where I started doing fertilizer trials planting density trials under canopy trials like really solid side by sides on under canopy, under, under canopy versus under canopy, I mean, that's where it really all started. Um, so I got really lucky and really fortunate to have that opportunity to, to do all these trials on somebody else's dime, to be honest with you, you know, and it was, this was 2020 and um, cannabis was flush with money in California. I mean, we were getting, you know, connected, I think raised like, like tens and tens of millions of dollars during that time. And it was all earmarked for cultivation. So we just had an unlimited budget to mess with R&D and it was, it was a lot of learning that went on during that time. So I, I really respect them and um, they gave me a, they really jumped off my career. So um, after I left Connected, I started Modern Technique Consulting, which is my consulting firm. Um, we manage about 5,500 lights um, in different states, uh, most of them in Northern California, but some in Phoenix, some in Mendocino, um, a couple of clients on the East Coast in Massachusetts, but um, most of it just in Sacramento. Um, so yeah, that's kind of who I am. So today, <clears throat> we're going to go over some general vocabulary for irrigation because everybody hears the term crop steering and everybody kind of knows what, you know, that means, but I want to make sure we're all on the same page for today's class. So if I use a term, everybody knows what I'm saying. Um, and then we're going to talk... <clears throat> We're gonna talk about something that I'm kind of, like a thread I'm pulling on in my own cultivation style and how I'm trying to get a little better as a, as a grower. And that's the importance of, th of like smooth transitions from early generative to vegetative to, to ripening or finishing or flushing, however you guys use that term. Um, and I'll go over all of those general terms as well. Um, keeping it simple. ABCs and plant triangles, we'll get into that. I'm a big proponent of keeping it simple. There's, like I said, there's a lot of information that gets thrown at you guys every day. You open up Instagram or YouTube, whatever. Um, and it is, it is very much worth your while to, to make sure you're digesting the right information and keeping it very simple because it's, it's easy to kind of get away from your baseline as a cultivator. Try one new thing and then try one new thing and try one new thing. And all of a sudden, you're three clicks away from your baseline and you've got things going wrong, right? So... Keep it simple. Um, and then we're gonna talk under canopy application because honestly, um, that's the new movement and here in two to three years, not a single cultivator is not gonna have to have under canopy. Like it's, it, it increases efficiency so much in your grow that it's going to be, you're gonna have to have it to be able to compete. That's just kind of what we're seeing in the trend. So but let's jump into it. Um, so water content. Water content is always expressed as a percentage, right? And that's just how much water is populating that substrate, right? So if you have a 50% water content, you know, 50% of that substrate is taken up by water. Simple. Um, and easy way to find that ratio is just your water content divided by the volume of your substrate. Um, there we go. I have a... Um, I have an apprentice now, which is funny because it's hilarious. I've, I've been growing a while and it's hard to find somebody who like wants to learn under you and whatnot. And he is, he's on me all the time about keeping my measurements the same, right? If you're using milliliters, use milliliters. If you, whatever you're using, keep it the same. Um, so when you're trying to figure out all this information, it's good to just keep using milliliters because 
you know, we're trying to figure out how much is coming out of our drip irrigation, right? Our little stakes, our Netafim, right? That's in milliliters. So it's best to just kind of keep that the same when you're looking at your substrate. So, and this slide is very much for him, but um, try to keep your measurements the same. So we have water content and then we have field capacity, right? And field capacity is going to change for every different type of media you're in, whether it's rock wool, cocoa, soil, pro mix. Um, you're going to have a different field capacity and that's the maximum amount of water that can fit inside that substrate, right? At 100% field capacity, right? Uh, let, me, let me rewind that, that's confusing. I, I grow in mostly cocoa. Um, usually 70-30 mix, so 70% cocoa, 30% perlite. And that field capacity is around 40 to 45%, right? Fully irrigated, that, that substrate can't handle any more volume, you're getting runoff at about 40 to 45%. Um, and that's kind of where I like my sweet spot. Um, and again, that number will never be 100% because there's soil in there, right? So soil is taking up another percentage of that. Um, Field, yeah, field capacity is determined by the type of substrate and its integrity, right? So if you guys are in rock wool, you know, if you dry them out too far, you're going to lose your ability to keep that rock wool saturated, right? It's called hydrophobic. So if your rock wool goes hydrophobic, it gets too dry even once, it's really hard to get that field capacity back and you're going to kind of struggle on that. But I'm not a big rock wool guy because... I've never been good at it, and it's honestly kicked my ass a million times. So um, I very much like to touch soil. I like I like Pro Mix. Pro Mix has been my go-to for a long time. Um, I used the Fox Farm back there for a long time, but Coco Seventy Thirty inside for, for indoor cultivation is is my favorite at the moment. So we then we have irrigation shots, um, and a shot is a single irrigation event, and. Everybody's into shot sizing now, and shot sizing is basically determining how big, how much volume you're giving to your plant in a single irrigation event. Um, and we try to keep them smaller to kind of mitigate any, um, call it channeling, right? If you give them to your plants too big of a single event, you're going to get some channeling through the soil because water is going to find the path of least resistance, right? So if you give it to it, like if you're hand watering and, um, you know, it's a dry plant, it's going to find it's the fastest way down and through the pot, which is usually around the edges, right? If it's like that dry, you know, you've got a big crack along the sides of your plant or along the, along the edge of your pot. Um, and so a, a one to three percent shot, when you hear that, is one to three percent based on how big your substrate is, right? It's not based on anything else. And this, this I feel like can get kind of lost, but that one to three percent shot is based on a a one gallon pot, so one percent of a one gallon pot, right? Um, and so a single shot is a single irrigation event, and then we'll also kind of talk. Um, I realized I did some updates to my slides, and they didn't populate. Um, we're also going to talk about um, <laughs> what, what's the term I'm using? An irrigation. Oh, an irrigation window, right? And so an irrigation window is made up of a ton of small shots, right? So if we're looking to get to field capacity in our one gallon pot, we're doing a bunch of tiny shots to get to field capacity, get to maximum capacity your plant can hold. And that time frame it takes you to get to field from start of your irrigation to field capacity, that's your irrigation window. Right, and you manipulate that irrigation window to kind of get the plants to do what you want them to do. Right, and we'll go over all that. But I wanted to kind of bring the or give you guys some background, of course. EC, right? Food, PPMs. If you've been growing long enough, you remember we were just all about PPMs. It's good. It's not the most reliable. EC is a better mode of measuring. Um, so there's two types of EC. There's EC that you get when you stick your pen in your solution or you stick your pen in your runoff. And then there's poor water EC, which is if you guys are, how many people are using substrate sensors in here? GrowLink, Arroyo, okay, a couple of you. So they're reporting poor water EC, right? They're looking at how much EC, how much food is available to the plant in the pores of the substrate. A little different than what you're seeing on EC input to your plants or if you're catching runoff, but about the same thing. Um, and yeah, 
I use both, right? I'm catching a runoff as well, and I think I go into this later. Here it is, never mind. So sensors and runoff data. Um, so there's a big difference between substrate EC and runoff EC. Um, and runoff EC is what I mean by that is your plants are at field capacity, you're still irrigating, and, you're, and water is running out the bottom, of that, right? Food is running out the bottom. And a big way to kind of measure how your plants are doing is to catch that runoff. One, measure how much runoff you're getting. Look at the pH of your runoff and look at the EC of your runoff. Like, and honestly, like here at the bottom, last bullet point, I walk through facilities all the time that are having issues. Mega facilities, 1,000 lighters, 2,000 lighters. They're having massive problems. And I can't tell you how many times catching some runoff Sticking a pH pen in there or an EC in an EC pen in there will will like really show us where that issue is starting. So, if you guys are having issues, whenever you, I have <laughs> I have tons of issues all the time. Um, when you're having those issues, catching runoff and really looking at those numbers is a great place to like start to work backwards from because a lot of times you can you can figure out what the issue is right there. It's, it's just a great spot to start. Um, so runoff EC is a great indicator of how much food the plants are consuming compared to the amount of food going into the plant, right? So if we're feeding at a 2.5 into the plant, right, 2.5 EC, and the output is lower, it's like a, you know, you test your output and it's a 1.7, well, your plants are consuming that difference, right, a 0.8 difference. So they're actually consuming all of the food you're giving it and then some, okay? Conversely, if you are catching runoff and you're putting your input is 2.5 and your runoff is three well you're stacking EC you're feeding your plants more than they need and there's some points of cultivation where we want to stack that EC up and there's some points where we want to keep that EC very level and kind of keep it negative where the plants are consuming more than they need um, and we'll go into that and when that timing is good um, substrate sensor is great for knowing exactly what's going on the substrate at that given moment so you can get that snapshot instantly you're like okay it's 11.15 on Saturday morning, what are they doing? Cool, they're good, right? Where runoff, you have to wait until an irrigation event to catch it. So kind of the difference. If you guys, for all of the home growers here, um, GrowLink is a good place to start. They're cheap, they're approachable. I think they're cheap still. I know they just dropped something new and I know nothing about it to be honest with you. But it should be kind of a similar system. They have the PIC controller, the PIC controller. It's a great place to start. I think the sensors plus the unit I think it was like 800 bucks, like one sensor, and you can run up to four sensors on it. This may be old knowledge, I'm sorry, but it's a great place to start and just start learning, to be honest with you. Um, oh, pH runoff. If your pH, if your input pH, I'm a big 5.8 guy, I love input at 5.8. That's just, that's my go-to. If you're running salt fertilizers, synthetic fertilizer, 5.8, it's a great pH all the way through start to finish. Um, if your input is 5.8 and you're seeing the runoff come in lower, that means you are building nutrients in your substrate. Okay, that's a good indicator you've got something building in. What that is, we don't know, right? But you're building. If your, e if your pH is coming out higher than 5.8, if it's 6.0, 6.2, you actually have a def not a deficiency, but your plants are consuming more than you're putting in. So if you see a high pH, likely you have a low EC coming out. Right, so those are um, conversely related, right? High pH, that means your plants are consuming more than you're giving them on your input. Does that make sense? Am I making sense still, everybody? Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, opposite, if your pH is coming out lower than 5.8 or whatever your input is, that means you're stacking in your soil, okay? So, so I'll watch that relationship and I really, this is a good rule of thumb, I don't ever like to see a 0.5 deviant than my input. So if I see my input at 5.8 and my runoff is coming out at 5, that is too much. And, and in my head, I'm trying to correct what's coming out, or what's, what's going into the substrate so I can kind of even out where the substrate is because we want the substrate to stay within that, like, that 0.5 difference of input. So the way I do that is just raise my input pH to level it out in the soil, right? Very, very simple, right? This, again, you can get as complex as you want or you can keep it as simple as you want. I'm gonna tell you right now, keeping it simple in irrigation and the design of your rooms is very advantageous. Like it's gotta be easy to be fixed and it's gotta be easy to, to work on. And I kind of see irrigation in the same approach. It's gotta be very simple and it works. Plants like consistency above else. Consistency always wins. 
Okay, so what is a phase? <clears throat> Raise your hand if you're familiar with like a P1 shot, a P2 shot, P3 shot. Okay, we're gonna jump into this. So a phase is a specific section of time used to describe a specific irrigation strategy within the window. So let me come over here and point. This is probably better. <clears throat> okay, if I'm blocking, let me know. <clears throat> so we have P0. This is also referred to as P4. So I don't want to confuse anybody. I was taught P0, so I use P0, but it is the same thing as a P4. So that just means phase zero, P zero, very simple. That is this red circle right here. P zero is the point of lowest saturation, okay? So right before your irrigation hits in the morning or right before you go hand water, that amount of water content in your soil, that's your P zero. I live and die on my P zero. To me, that is the most important number in all of cultivation. That is how, how much water, how much food do your plants have available? at that point, right? And that is very important with how to control your stretch or control your, um, conversely, how to not, or how to control your stack, how to control your stretch. And if you want a bigger plant or a smaller plant, that this is how you do it. You control water availability at P0. So pretty easy. Phase zero is your start point. Phase one, P1, is your irrigation from P0 to field capacity. Right? So that first, those first morning shots, your lights come on, boom, you're giving your, free, your P1s or you're going in, if you're hand watering still, which is completely fine, it's a, great way to grow. it's a great way to grow. That initial soak event, that first event, that's your P1, okay? And so we're going to P1 up to capacity, field capacity, about most of the time, okay? And as we talked earlier, it's made up of a ton of smaller shots to kind of limit the runoff in our plants, okay? That's what this, that's what this, this jigsaw, or not jigsaw, the uh, saw blade. Saw blade, thank you. <laughs> that's, what this, that's what this is, right? Those are individual irrigation events getting to field capacity. And then here, this is called phase two, okay? So we've got P0, our lowest saturation, P1, we are getting to field capacity. There's no, more, there's no more room for water in that substrate, okay? P2 is the time from which the substrate has reached field capacity and irrigations continue until its final irrigation event before it lights off, okay? So this is you maintaining your field capacity. There's a couple ways to go about P2. Just remember that the P2s occur after you've reached field capacity. We can, there's a ton of ways. This is, this is really where you control quality, to be honest with you. We'll get into that. Is that a hand? Yeah, I just have a quick question. Yes. So, um, when it comes to taking like runoff, yeah. do you want to take runoff from just your P1s or should we be taking them? Great question. P1s Great question. I like to catch it after my P1. Okay. I think. But uh, Athena put something out recently about leaving it there until after your P2s. And I think they, confusing. to be honest, I think they both work. Find what works best for you. Okay. I like to catch it after P1 because I want to know what my EC was after I reached field capacity the first time. Okay. Those are what all my numbers going back 15 years, like I have, I have like, you know, handwritten notes from way long ago in my notebooks and catching runoff and not really knowing what it meant, yeah. right? But all of my baseline is catching after P1. Okay. So I will not change it, right? That's just me. But if it works for you, exactly. And Athena puts out great stuff. Like I will not, I'm not going to sit up here. And they, they've spent a lot of time on their, on their SOPs and they do a great job. Um, but that really good question. That's a really good question. Um, okay. So P zero, your lowest saturation point, right? P one up to field capacity, P two maintaining field capacity in some way. And we'll get into all the different ways of going about it. After you're done irrigating, you've ended irrigating. It's, close to, you know, you got a couple hours before the lights turn off or the day ends. P3 is the time, your last irrigation event to P0 the next morning, right? Your nighttime dry back, okay? So P0, lowest point, P1, getting to saturation, P2, maintaining that saturation, P3 is your dry back, that's it. Does that make sense, or like, am I good? Okay. And if you already knew that, I'm sorry, but I also see things um, 
I also th see different terms used, so I wanted to make sure everybody understood what, what I meant when I was saying it. it. It just goes a long way for the sake of conversation. So here's another chart. We've got, again, if you can see the little red, uh, red was a bad color choice on my end, sorry. Um, red is P0, right? The red circles at the bottom. Then you've got this straight line up. Well, that's your P1. There are no P2s in this video or in this picture, right? This is just a P0, a P1, and then your dry back for P3, okay? Conversely, this is P0, P1, P2, P3. So you can see, let me just make sure. Let's do this. So we've got P0, P1, and then these are your P2s, okay? P2, P2, and you can see here we drop, there's two P2s here, two P2 events, and then there's only one P2 event here, and then there's none here, and we'll get into this, this is kind of like my transition topic, so um, we'll get into this a little more, but does that make sense to everybody, we're on the same page? What's the time frame on all these charts? So, is this oh, like one day? Or no, one? great, great, great question, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is, this lit up section right here. This is your 12 hours of lights on. Oh, okay. And this is 12 hours of lights off. I'm very sorry about that, guys. So, so these are lights on, 12 hours, lights off, 12 hours. So this is one, two, three, four, five days right here. Does that make sense? So and every morning, they get down to a certain point, you irrigate the fuel capacity. And then the next day, and then the next day. That's it. So I'm watering daily on your district. Yes. Which watering daily is something that people are going to push on you because... There's Even something, more it's more nutrients. It's in like feeding your plants. If they're transpiring, they're growing. If they're transpiring, they're photosynthesizing. So you're gonna get more if you're irrigating, if your plants can handle being irrigated daily. They do not need to be irrigated daily to grow good weed though. That's something that like is different from like how like companies teach you how to grow and how we just used to grow with hand watering and you know, the plants dry, give it water, right? Like that still works guys. So like if this is wild and complex, like just if your plants dry water, it, it's, it works, you know? So, but, but good questions. Um, okay. What do I got here? Okay. So there are really, so commercial operations, we're growing weed for about 63 days, right? Most people are nine weeks, 63 days, okay? If you're shorter, great. If you're longer, great too. Um, within that 63 days, there are four different, I don't want to call it phases because that'll confuse with the P, P1s and the P2s, but there are four different sections of irrigation strategies that you can apply to get the most out of your plants, okay? Um, and this is really where crop steering comes in, all right? And I, crop steering is a great term. Um, it's been around for decades in big ag. Everybody here is crop steering when you make a single temperature adjustment to your tent even, right? You're crop steering, you are. Um, the irrigation strategy attached to crop steering is, is really where you can get your plants to express how you want them to express. So, um, Instead of holding questions to the end on this one, as I go, if you have questions, just shoot them off because I, I want to make sure I'm very clear in this next section. Um, so step one, it's the, about the first five to seven days of flower, okay? Um, and in my opinion, this is the most important time to establish control over your plants. And I don't mean control is like, you do what I say, plant, but like, understanding where the drybacks are, how much they're drinking every day. Like this is when you're really establishing what these plants are gonna do and what they're ready for. If they're ready for daily irrigation or every, or every other day, whatever. Where, where are you plants? Um, so it's important to have a good understanding of drybacks and core EC or drain EC, either one or both would be better um, at this point. Okay, and how you irrigate will have a big impact on how vigorous growth will be, okay? So this comes into like, what genetic are you growing? Um, so if I use the examples of like sour diesel, does everybody know kind of what I'm saying? Like a big, long sativa takes for like it's a big, tall stretches. 
How, Bubba, do you guys know Bubba? Usually I'm, I'm in the Bay Area and everybody knows Bubba, man. That was the, <laughs> that was the king for a long time, purples and Bubba. Um, Bubba is a very short, um, squatty plant, right? And Sour D is very long and lanky. If you're growing Sherbanger, if you have Sherbanger cuts, Sherbanger is the wildest thing out there right now. The thing just stretches like crazy. Um, how you irrigate in these first five to seven days will really determine the size of that plant. So if you have a very squatty plant and you want it to get bigger, you can actually increase its water availability at P0, right? So every day it's drying down less and, well, let me take back. It's drying down to a point where it still has a lot of water in the soil so that it always has something to pull from and grow, okay? So if you're running something that's very stretchy and you're in a tent or you're, you got some low ceilings going on, being drier in the first couple of days is really good to keep those plants short, okay? Water availability at, at P0 is big. Anybody who's got double stacks, I don't know if anybody's doing double stacks in here, but two-tiered growing systems, it is all about water availability early on, all about it, um, and controlling how much resources that plant has available to it, right? You can really control how it's going to respond. Yeah. So maybe instead of like a 50%, do like a 30 the whole way through? Just for those, I'm, I'm just talking in this first like section of five to seven days. And then you can go to 50% through 21 days. So, no, no, no. I don't really adhere to the, the, the percentage of dry back. And that's just because I think P0 number is more important than how much it dried back. Um, a lot of people go against me on this. But I, so I don't want to talk in percentages and that, but the overall theme of drying back less, totally, okay. totally. And then there's like, and we can get into this later, but like you can also throw, uh, maybe, maybe bad time to get into it, but there's a, there's a way to throw irrigation events later in the day for those squatty plants to get them to stretch. I like to leave my start times the same okay. I just, I just and I like to play it for the next day. So I think in cultivation, you're going to have, there's, there's no perfection in cultivation, right? So if I have a day where, where I have a full room or I have a row that's landing too dry, instead of correcting, instead of correcting that day, I'll like, okay, they landed that dry, too dry today. Tomorrow they can't land too dry. Because one day is fine. One day too wet or one day too dry is fine. But you start compounding days and that's when things get weird. So you just have to be on it. So instead of moving up your start time and messing around with that, I'd rather mess around with how long I'm irrigating because it's an easier control, right? Because then you're messing with like, you know, when you get to the commercial level, there's, you know, our, our Phoenix facility has a hundred benches. If I start a hundred irrigation zones. So like if I start messing with where they, the start times are, it's, it's just a mess. Yeah, your data collection and stuff. It's just jacked. And then I have to be like, oh yeah, that one fired early. And then this one, you know, so I would, I like to just manage for the next day. I think it's easy. And I think the plants, it's a resilient plant. It's a freaking weed. It can handle it. It's just, and, and with anything, environmental issues, irrigation, um, two or more days with that issue is detrimental or two or more issues is detrimental. Your plant can handle one-offs all day. You're not really going to see an interruption, right? So anyway, good question though. Um, so step one, the first five to seven days, really, really important to, to really establish control of the plants, understand what they're doing and move on from there. Um, step two. So this, this used to be referred to as stretch, right? Your plants are just going wild during this time the next like 14 to 17 days. And we now refer to it as stack, um, right? And this is like, this time frame, this, this like two and a half weeks is gonna determine your yield potential almost fully, all right? If you miss this step, your yield potential is gonna be diminished. Um, so this, time frame is considered generative, okay? We are generating 
something. We are generating stack. We are generating flower sites. So easy to, to remember. So heavy drybacks between irrigations promote tight internode spacing, okay? The lack of water availability and keeping your irrigations in a small irrigation window, similar to... Oh, no, I'm going the wrong way. I'm like showing you guys all my cards, damn it. So this right here, this is a generative chart, okay? We have one single P P1 event and we're drying back heavy, okay? This is how you generate good stack. This is how you, you limit the stretch of your plants, right? And you can, you can grow any way you want. You don't have to listen to any of this, but establishing a good stack is really like, everybody's gotta have yield. Like everybody's gotta have yield to survive. And unfortunately, it is the biggest driver of whether you can stay in business or you go out of business. Doesn't matter what state you're in, this is how it is. Um, so nailing these 14 to 17 days is very important. Um, and it's really characterized by, we want to see a little bit of runoff, not very much runoff, right? We don't want to give these plants too much water availability. We kind of limit their water availability. We want to see higher EC runoff. Um, and we want to see lower P0 targets, right? So um, anybody who's grown with sensors, like I'm like, I'm like sub 25% in the mornings for most genetics, you know, I'm, and like, I like to be there and I, you can go drier than that. You can stay wetter than that, depending on genetics. But like usually about 20, like 20 to 25% is a nice sweet spot. You can be, you can definitely be drier. Um, but you're also looking heavy drybacks and high food content, right? Because the food is really going to drive the plants to put on those flower sites. So does that make sense? That's your next Basically, step one, five to seven days. Step two, the next two and a half weeks, call it day, we're at day 25 of flower, okay? Make sense? All right. So adding weight. The next, I didn't put a time frame on here like a goober. Basically, the next three and a half weeks. Um, next 20, 25, next 25 days or so. Your plants are done stretching, right? We're putting on weight. And to me, like consistency is always key throughout every phase, but even more so during bulk, right? I see a lot of people that have too high of EC going into their plants or, or the substrate's too high. Um, they're inconsistent with their irrigation events or their environmentals are kind of jacked. Um, keeping those three elements in line is the key to really having a great, a great yield. Um, and this is a lot of, this is the most important time in the plant's life because this is going to determine your quality and your, your ratio between quality and yield, because this is the point where you can really boof out your plants, to be honest with you. What's your, what's your target zone for your media EC and your runoff EC? Your runoff EC, I like to see. No more than if I'm inputting at 2.5, I really don't want to see it above 3.5 on runoff. Um, you probably can creep a little higher than that, but if I, yeah, but if I see like above 4 or 5, and like every genetic is different, man, but I err on the side of lower and that, that does well for me. Like they don't need a lot right now. I like in this time to like, think of a bodybuilder, right? Like bodybuilders aren't having you know three big meals a day they're eating like nuts and berries all day like little consistent food all day right they're not just engorging themselves on a fat steak at night that's not how you build muscle right it's not how you build flour we need very consistent irrigations we need consistent ecs right so i don't want to see a difference of my input and my output too high right whereas during generative i want to see that difference a lot higher right I don't mind like four or five to five, five runoff EC. I think that's a nice place to be. I don't like going any higher than that. Again, genetic preference, who knows, but you know, I, I have, I have runoff data from like, um, I grew, I, I got, I got taught to learn in, I got taught indoors, but I grew mostly outdoor and, and, and depth, um, during the not so legal days in Cali. 
And I used to like dig trenches under my beds and like stick a freaking Tupperware under there and like catch runoff that way. And I remember freaking out when I saw like a 2.8 runoff, you know, like low EC was a thing, you know, back in the day, these, these 3.5 and 4.0 EC inputs are wild. But even then I noticed that it was like the more consistent I could be and the closer that was that input to my output, the plants just liked it better and they just clicked, you know? And so I kind of still err on the side of lower than higher. Um, and I think a good indication if your EC is too high is that you guys will start to, your, your buds will start to finish sooner than you want them to. And they'll kind of popcorn out. They may end up super cracked out, purple, just covered in trikes, but you've got no weight. Your EC got out of line. I almost guarantee it. All right. And like I said earlier, and I go into facilities, you know, $10 million facilities, they got every bell and whistle. And it really comes down to catching that, that drain to, is what corrects their problem. You know, it, it's all this stuff is like, it's the basics, but it's, it's really like, it's, it's everything. It's the ABCs, you know? What's your opinion on the tip burn? Is it when, like Tyler was saying, Incognito was saying that if you're seeing tip burn to push a higher EC, especially during stretch or stack, because they're basically a deficiency calling for more food. But if you're seeing like, if you're pushing like a three, five input and you're seeing like a seven or eight, you know, yeah. runoff, are they, are they calling for more EC or are they calling for a deficiency of something specific going in? So that's why they're saying give a higher EC to that direction. I haven't seen that. Um, Tyler's a really smart guy. Um, he's very much on the scientific side. Not that there's two sides, but you can lean more scientific or applied. I land more in the applied category, even though I've been to the big ag school and I've I've learned that way. I really stick to like my applied knowledge and what I have learned. When I see tip burn, it means things are a little high in there, right? Like food's a little high. I don't mind seeing tip burn during early generative though. And those, those like that 14 to 17 day stack. I don't mind seeing it. That means it's up there. That EC's up there, you know, I don't mind it. So, but when I switch to bulk, I'm flushing that out. I want to, as soon as I'm switching to bulk, and we'll go over this here soon. As soon as I switch to bulk, this, this step three that we're talking about, adding weight, I want, I'm dropping that substrate EC. I'm dropping my input a little bit. And um, I'm just trying to make it so that EC is consistent all day, all day. What's your opinion on if you do see a tip burn and, and you're feeding at, you know, 3.5, maybe 4.0, would you just uh, do like a leach day, get a pure water, then go right back into the EC? So this is again applied and scientific you're never supposed to give your plants water yeah. right you're never supposed to do it but they actually really like water like they actually really like pure water it's just not a good idea to do it late in flower because it really can bring in botrytis to flush it right i i think the answer i'm supposed to give you is i would flush with a lower nutrient solution like a 1-0 or a 1-5 and get there rather than fresh water but i don't mind fresh water let me be honest with you Yeah. Nectar and stuff like that, and that's what I was kind of thinking that when he was talking about that, you know, where you're not trying to lock your uh, substrate up. Right. You got to be very careful because they plants can handle a ton of food, late in flower, mm -hmm. and early in flower. But yeah. this middle section, they don't want the food. They well, they want food, but they don't want a lot of it. And a lot. Of, this is where a lot of people destroy their yields because everything's the hairs start to turn early. Your hair shouldn't be turning until late week seven. So if you see a single orange hair on there and you didn't spray and it wasn't you in there deleafing like messing with your, you know, your pistols, like it's probably your EC coming. And like this runcy candy stuff that everybody's got to run, hella sensitive, just super sensitive to it. And so I actually, I, I, I like candies in the sense that they keep you honest because if you have them, I kind of use them as an indicator plant. Like if I see them getting a little wonky, a little early senescence, the hairs are curling back, I know my ECs are a little high, and they're gonna do it before the rest of my genetics do it. Right, they're my uh, canary in the coal mine, if you will, you know? Yeah? So, you, so do you suggest feeding an input at like 2.5 versus that 3.0, 3.5? Because like, it's so tough. so out there, and I, you know, I know it's based on what you prefer, but yeah. we do notice, like we do feed the higher EC, and we do, like you said, get that higher, um, Runoff yeah. And we don't really know like what how should we adjust that? You know, like if I am getting that, like you 
said, just should I lower that input you see, or should I like do the thing, use like a cleanse and try to like flush some of that stuff out? I would just drop your input, you know. If it's too high, so like, say you catch runoff, you're in bulk and it comes out high, that next irrigation event, those P2s or whatever, that next, I'm, I'm sending a lower um, fertilizer level and I'm flushing that way and I'm sending volume, right? I think, I think if you're having to add water to your regimen, you're already just putting in too much. You might as well back off on your food and save some money. And I'd rather control it on the daily than have this one big event where we flush it out once a week. I do, that's how I used to grow. I used to do two feeds on, one feed off. You know, and that's like very old school. Like that's how my depths all ran. But um, I think there's a better way to do it and get them food every day because they do, they are eating certain elements in there to their entirety. So giving them new food every day is actually ne a necessity. So, uh, I had one point of, of like the last part about the East Chi. Yeah. Um, it really, your East Chi makeup, uh, to me, I've always seen that my East Chi makeup is like makeup to my room. So if I'm on CO2, if I'm on LED, double ended, what I'm doing is really kind of making the East Chi match. I'm my East Chi and I'm changing my East Chi every week. Yeah. And, and pulling back. So really, you don't know, you got to really know your room and the download yep. of your room to actually put your East Chi's in there. So 100%. some people could run at 4.0, some people could run at 2.5. It really depends on what your room's at. Yep. Are you running five tons in there or you, or you got a mini sport? Yeah, yeah, so straight up. Yeah, so there's a lot to it. So I think that runoff part is a, a, a huge deal. I l and like the guys that I know still catching runoff, they have all the bells and whistles too, and they're the best. You know, the, the cultivators that I know really catch and run off every day or every other day, they're the ones that consistently crush and they're the ones going to stay in business. Um, but yeah, it's whatever demand you're placing on your plant. Like LEDs place a higher demand than HPS. So you got to feed a little more, right? That was like a big learning curve when the LED switch happened. But yeah, good points. I mean, all around, it's like whatever your room can handle, right? <laughs> Genetic wise too. Um, so just to step back one second, we've got early go back we've got establishing control the first five to seven days right and then we've got stack stack is when we're trying to see a higher EC runoff than what we're putting in okay um, we want bigger drybacks step three what we're talking about now you know weeks five to seven call it right Smaller drybacks between irrigations, right? Because the smaller the dryback, the less time there is for EC to spike, right? EC is just salt building up in your, in your soil. So think of a salty, like salt water on a hot day. Like it's just gonna, it's the same thing as a dryback and plants consuming that water. As, as, that, as that water evaporates, the salt content gets higher of the water that's left over. And that's what, EC, that's what we're measuring on the runoff. So we want that to stay very consistent for those weeks. If you can nail your consistency and not have spikes up, if you're using graphs and you don't see a real big spike up and it's being consistent, I guarantee these are going to be like some of the best rooms you have. Um, higher P0 targets. So if I'm drying back to like 20 to 25% um, during generative or even drier than that, I like to be like 25 to like 35%, but I actually, I grow a lot of genetics that are very sensitive to water content at P0. If it's too high, they'll start to grow kind of, They'll, they won't maintain their structure, right? They'll get all wonky. They'll grow like Bozo the Clown, you know, sides off of them. Um, so I like to stay between like, t like specifically like 26 and 30%. That's my sweet spot. Um, this is a critical time for quality and yield, right? And this is, this is a vegetative time. So your plants, during vegetative times, your plants are using a ton of energy and a ton of resources because they're trying to put those big buds on and they're trying to put trikes on, they're trying to put everything on because they want to get pollinated and they want to survive to the next generation. Like that's what the flower is. It's there to get pollinated, right? And to make seeds. Um, so did I do this? Okay. So there's kind of two ways, actually. There's two ways people are teaching irrigation right now. Uh, okay. Let me show you how I irrigate P2s. So again, P2s are the phase after you've reached field capacity the first time in your P1, okay? How I'm using P2s, 
you can lose a lot of your quality at this point in flower. This is almost, I'd say this is a good portion of it, like at least 60 to 70% of your quality and quantity is gonna come from this time. So as you can see here, we've got our P1 event, right? P0 up to field capacity. And then I'm letting plants dry back in between these P2 shots, okay? If I let them only go to, only do a P1, they're gonna dry back way too far, right? They're gonna dry back from here all the way to the next day and it's gonna end up like way down here. It's gonna be way too dry. So those P2s are just to maintain my water content at my P0 the next morning, okay? The more P2 events that you throw, the more bulking your plants will do, okay? The more weight they will put on. But there is a fine line between too much bulk and quality. Okay, and this is where a lot of people get missed. Um, so as you can see here, I only have two P2 shots and that's plenty. That dry back in between your P2s is very important. You don't need six, seven P2s. If you wanna run it that way and you're in rock wool and you're running it like that, that's fine. You, you run it how you wanna run it. But you don't need that. And honestly, I see a lot of people bulk the heck out of their plants they get done, they chop it, and they've got botrytis, and they've got mold, and they have whatever, because they've just added so much density to these tops that the plants, it just, it just becomes a dead air zone for the plant. Every time you send a P2 irrigation, you're, you're triggering a vegetative response in your plant. They're going to grow every single time, right? Whether It doesn't matter what phase you're in, early, generative, stack, bulk, doesn't matter. If you send a P2 shot, if you send a shot by itself outside of your irrigation window, it's going to cue a vegetative response. So if you have that squatty plant back, back there, if you have those squatty plants and you're trying to kind of push them, you're trying to make them bigger, you can send P2 shots to them early on and during stretch and they'll, they'll stretch more, you know? Conversely, like you don't really want to do that to a sour diesel or a sherbanger. You want that thing to stay short, right? So you don't send the P2 shots. So this is how I irrigate um, my bulk. Usually I'm two P2 shots, two to three P2 shots max. And what I think is really important is you can start with more P2 shots. You can hit them for the first week, kind of help transition your plants to bulking. And then you start removing a P2 shot every week until you're down to ripening. So you can start heavy with your bulk and then you can kind of pitter off because the closer you get to, to harvest, the more your quality needs to be there, right? Um, and this is something that's really lost in the industry right now. And I see it in California, I see it everywhere. Um, everybody being told to irrigate a certain way by a certain company. And yeah, that may give you more yield, but what the hell are you gonna do with packs that need to be sold at 600 bucks? Like, that's not good. Like four pounds of light is cool, but if you have to sell them at 600, you only made $2,400 on that light. Like we need to be closer to $4,000 a light to really maintain it and sustain. At least in California, we've got to be at minimum $2,000 a light or $4,000 a light. What about in Rockwell? Would you do maybe more than those two shots? A lot of people in Rockwell are running it closer to, uh, hold on, this. So this is the other way. Yeah, this is the other way to run it. All these P2 shots right here, that sawtooth, right? That's a lot of P2s. I have two or three max, right? This is like 10. This works though. Like it, it all works. Like cannabis is going to grow, whatever, pretty, as long as it's watered. So this is probably Rockwell. Rockwell dries out faster, right? It's got a higher field capacity. Like your field capacity is closer to 70 to 80%, whereas cocoa is like 40 to 50, right? So those, it dries back quicker. We're actually using a 52% cocoa. Oh, cool. We're trying to kind of find that median of how many shots is yeah. required. And I would just start with like, you make that transition into bulk. I would start with more P2s, however many maximum you want. And then every week, take one off, take one off. The closer you get to ripening, you really, you really got to take those off. Right. I have a question from P1s, I'm sorry. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, what do you, I, don't, I don't do that, but I, I go straight up like you do. Is that important to have those tiny little drybacks between the ramp-up shots? Or what's the point? 
I don't think so, but like, again, it's like, I'm not gonna, if somebody sitting here like, like uh, Mitten Master was supposed to be here and he's somebody who I would kind of pull on for like, hey, what do you do right now? Because, you know, and I think he likes a little dry back in between his, he, his family is sick, he wasn't able to make it. Um, but yeah, so like both work. What they're talking about in this like step up, because right here you can see the P1 little dry back, is just making sure you're not getting channeling. That's really the, the goal, is you want to make sure the substrate in its entirety is being um, saturated, thank you. <laughs> Um, your, the entire substrate is saturated. And if you're giving these one big shots, likely, again, they're just that water's finding the path of least resistance and it's finding its way out of your pot, right? We call that channeling. And really the best yields you're ever gonna get, the most healthy plants you're ever gonna get is when the substrate is completely saturated every single day, if they can handle it. If they need to dry back in between days, that's totally fine too. But when it, it gets irrigated, it needs to go to capacity at, the P, at P1. Um, so there's nothing wrong with this, and I'm not trying to go at any companies that tell you to do this. I'm just telling you there's less is a little bit more, right? And a lot of times in cannabis, less is more. Um, so there's two ways to kind of go about your P2s. You can have this crazy sawtooth, or you can send a few of them, a handful of them, and start pulling them off one by one as you get closer to ripen. It's a really, really good way to do it. Yes? Yeah. So plants aren't really moving water until 45 minutes after lights on. So your earliest event should always be an hour, you know, 45 minutes to an hour. Um, that's at the earliest you should ever irrigate, even if they're hella dry, like you, like something happened, they're super dry you got to let them wake up because you actually stunt the heck out of them. You'll actually drown the roots if, if, you know, if, if you do, if you irrigate too early, but during generative, during early, I'm two hours after lights on and during bulking, I'm one hour after lights on. And that is strictly because bulking the step three, this adding weight, we want consistent EC. If you let those plants continue to dry back in the morning, that EC is going to start spiking right? Because it's consuming the water that's there and the residual salt is just building up. So because in the name of consistency and low EC, we want to irrigate as soon as they, they're like starting to eat, you know? And also starting an hour after lights on gives you more time to throw an extra P2 in there if you want it, right? That's like more of an irrigation window for the day, if you will. Um, so yeah, bulking shots, like I said, critical time for quality and yield. You need both to compete, but there are ways of getting both. There's, it's, and it's very much a tiptoe between what is being put out there and, and, um, and what isn't. Um, everybody feel good about bulking? We can go back with questions later, no problem. Um, so ripening used to be called flush. We used to shove water down our plant's throats for like two weeks every single day to make sure there's nothing left in the soil, and that is wrong. Do not do that. If you want to keep doing it, that's fine, but don't do that. Um, <laughs> what you're doing is you're opening the plant up to, to molds and mildews because you've stripped them of everything they need to defend, right? You, they need nutrients. They, they need potassium to build strong cell walls. Like, they need it. So we are feeding. You can feed it a lower EC input if you want, but we are still feeding all the way up till harvest, okay? It's very important. So ripening as it's called now I, I like to I like to compare it or I like to where step three adding weight consistency is key the key for ripening is controlled stress okay if you keep your plants too comfy at the end of flower you are not going to be happy with your weed stress is what brings out the best in the cannabis plants and but small stressors not big stressors um, stress like we want a bigger dry back, but not super dry like we were early on in the plant's life during generative, like the early generative, during phase two, right? Not like during, a, during stack, if I'm, if I'm 20 to 25% during stack at, at P0, 
during ripening, I'm at like 20, 25%, right? I'm like right at 25%. That's kind of my goal. I love to be at 25%. Um, bigger dry back, but not detrimental, right? We want to dry back a little more, but not to the point of like, you're seeing droopy plants. Like you never want to see that. Um, slightly elevated substrate and runoff EC. So you may be inputting a little less, but because you have dr bigger dry backs, you are, you're seeing a higher EC spike throughout the day, but not, we don't want to see massive spikes. We just want to see a little more than we were doing in bulking, right? So you don't suggest flushing with cleanse? No. Okay. I mean, so you, it's, uh, lower your input. yeah. And I don't use cleanse. Uh, cleanse to me is like hooking your kid up to antibiotics 24 seven. They're just never going to be resilient to anything. Okay. Same with feeding high. You're kind of like, you're kind of like, like food will help the plant get through environmental stressors. So feed high if you have to, but like, it's also kind of a crutch, right? Like you're not, you don't really know what the plants are doing if you're just throwing 4-0 down its throat. But those are just personal preferences. Do you cleanse at all? Do you the whole time? No, I don't. But, um, yeah, I just clean them in between runs. Okay, do you ever yeah. test like dripper issues and stuff? Not really. Okay. No, and like, this is, this is the, this is the hard part about like trying to put out educational material is like, if you're running Athena and you're running that program start to finish, follow what they say, because that's what works for that regimen. Okay. Cleanse is just not something I ever needed in the past. There was no need for me to input it today, you know? So if you're running it already, don't just take it out and you're going to be like, dude, that Bobby Bags guy, that guy sucks. He told me to remove cleanse and, and my dripper's clogged and everything sucks, you know, like don't do that. So like stick to your regimen, but like cleanse is expensive, dude. Like it's wildly expensive and it's like five cents to make. So like, it's, it's like, it's not my favorite product, I guess you could say, but um, I have no allegiance. I mix my own fertilizer on a lot of my stuff. So like I have no allegiance to any brand. So that helps. Um, so let's see, do I have, yeah. So another thing with late and ripening, the more P2 shots you send, the more your plants are going to think that they still want to grow, right? So the last two weeks, I'm sorry, I didn't give you a time frame. Let me, let me back up. First five to seven days is your first, first stage. And then we have stacking, that's your next 14, 17 days. So call it day 25, we're there. And then we have bulk, and that's basically day 25 to day 50, okay? Just call it there. So we're at day 50 now. And as you can see, so call this day 50, 49, 48, 47, 46. At day 46, I'm still bulking with two shots. Day 40, 40, 47, still got bulking with two shots. Day 48, I've only got one P2 shot. Right, I'm pulling that shot, I'm letting them know, hey, the stress is coming, okay? We're drying down more in between the P2 shot. This P2 shot is really just to maintain a good water content in the morning. It's more of a maintenance shot. We're maintaining water content the next morning, right? That's the, it's a P2 shot, but it's doing a different thing for us. So it's same thing, but think of it as a maintenance shot when it gets there. So one P2, one P2, and then no P2. And that is how you signal ripening to the plant with water stress, okay? And a lot of times, especially rock wool, or a lot of people are, and we'll get into this in a second, a lot of people are undersizing their substrate. If you pull all your P2s, your plants will probably be bone dry in the morning and dead. So that can't happen. A lot of people's ripening stage looks like this day 49 or 48 right here. It's got, it's got this maintenance shot just to maintain the dry back. Okay, does that make sense? If you're in a bigger pot and you can water once a day, great. But a lot of times we've ramped these, <laughs> um, it's like a bodybuilder that doesn't hit leg day, right? Like it's a very small substrate at the bottom and it's this big old plant up top and it, that big old plant still needs water in the morning, right? If we dry it out too much, it's just gonna wilt and that's not good. Um, there we go, uh, substrate sizing, too small. Um, so this is very generative. We are signaling to the plant that it's, it, it's time to finish. It's the end of life. And we're generating, this is a lot of cannabinoids. This is your THC. This is your terps. Like 
This is a lot of it. If you're too bulky going into this time, you're going to really lose a lot of that. Um, so again, controlled stress. Maybe you want to drop your temperatures at night. Not too far because your dehums won't be able to catch up, everybody. Or won't be able to keep up. But controlled stress. Little stressors. Little stressors that progressively get more stressful. Does that make sense? The temperature during the day yeah. when we're starting to rise then, Yeah, I drop temps. I, drop, I slowly drop temps night and day as we go. Um, and I know this is very much an irrigation class. You have to irrigate to your environment. Your environment dictates all of this. Like this doesn't work unless you have a good environment. Um, and I'm, I don't really like to go too cold at night because that's where you allow in a lot of molds, a lot of PM, like everybody will see it kind of pop up at the end. Well, that's because dehums are rated at like 78 to 80 degrees. Anything less than 68 degrees on a, on a dehumidifier actually renders them like, it takes them down to like 20% efficiency. So they actually just cannot pull water out of the air at colder temperatures. So like dropping your temps too cold at night, you're really just asking for humidity to be out of control and a lot of problems to happen. In California, we have to have purple weed or it does not sell. And temperature is it, it's, <laughs> sorry, is that the same around here? Yeah, right, yeah. Right. Well, it's the same everywhere then. It's great. Yeah, because apparently purple's better. But I distinctly remember 2017 not being able to sell purple weed. So whatever. Anyway, um, water stress will actually bring purple as well. Like if you keep plants really happy and healthy, they'll continue to to put on green and they'll be very green. But if you stress them out, like that buildup of salt, that spike of EC in the morning, will actually cause a little bit of purple as well. Um, so yeah, ripening. Last two weeks, usually, you can do whatever you want, but last two weeks, bigger drybacks, but not detrimental. Slightly elevated substrate and EC runoff, okay? And then we're really signaling the end of life to the plant. Like we want it to feel like it's fall outside, right? Less water, you know, a little bit less, like I don't really, don't, don't really mess with your intensity. If you mess with your intensity, you're going to jack your plant up and it's going to, it's not gonna do what you want it to. Light intensity is actually a really good push of purple as well. So if you're dropping your light intensity, trying to get purple, you're doing the opposite. Um, and yeah, it is, it is a generative time. You're generating cannabinoids, really. You're generating quality. So that's why it is, that's a good way to think about it. So we have stack, which is generative. Yeah. Dropping your, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. the environment's changing. You're saying that it, you, like if, I, if I'm running full, you know, 1300, 1400 ppm CO2, and then I start taking that down to sub 1000 into our eight, um, I generally take my LEDs down with it because the plants tend to want to burn. Good. Yeah, totally. So, good point. See, again, this is the tricky part of like trying to put out information and not like contradict well, so much it, it is it is but you're, it's a good point because um and same with temperature right, right your yeah. plants can only absorb as much co2 as is as it is warm right if, if you're if it's 100 degrees plants can run at 3,000 ppm and they're stoked yeah. but if you're at if you're trying to throw 2,000 ppm on them and it's only 70 degrees like you're just toxifying your plants right so like temperature is CO2 absorption. So if you're dropping your temperature, you should be dropping your CO2, right? Or else you're just kind of wasting it. Light intensity, that's the demand you're placing on your plants. That's the direct demand, right? So if you're dropping temps during the day and dropping CO2, you could, you dropping your light intensity isn't bad. I would, I would, I don't push over 1100 on LEDs just because I don't like it. But I know people who do phenomenal jobs at higher rates. Very much. And how the distance between is very important. So I feel like if you're not, I feel like if you're at like 1,000 to 1,100, you're probably fine by dropping that CO2. And that's that little bit of stress that you need. And to me, pulling CO2 the last two weeks is smart. There's a lot of quality arguments for pulling CO2 late. So something to kind of experiment with or take it down to at least ambient. Ambient's like four to 500. 
you know, making sure they're not like deficient on CO2, but they've got a little something. Um, but good point. Every room's different. So like, are you pulling good color with that? Yeah. Okay. Oh, see, that's the best. You're cheating. Yeah. Yeah. The checkerboards are the best rooms, even in Cali right now. Oh, those are my two favorite lights. <laughs> Yeah. Like I said, you know, when they're coming towards the end there, yeah. tapering it off is kind of... Yeah, you kind of have to. With it right now. Oh, good. We're still on the... The mic is still working. We're good. Um, that's a good point, man. And again, it's, it's tough to put out information and, like, try not to contradict or be like, oh, this is the exception and this is the exception, this is the exception, you know, but there are so many exceptions to everything I talked about, right. you know. Um, but good point. Um, if you're lower in temperature, you guys should be dropping your CO2 or else you're just kind of wasting CO2, just to let you know. Um, but thank you for that. I appreciate it. I love the, I love the checkerboard rooms, man. And I really like those Gavita 1930s. <clears throat> so something that I'm, I'm actually talking a lot longer than I thought I would. Um, but I hope I'm not boring you guys. Um, this is something I'm trying to refine in my own practice is transitioning between early generative and bulking, and then bulking and ripening, right? Those transitions, it's very easy to make it a one day thing. You're like, okay, it's day 25, they're gonna, tomorrow they're gonna bulk. And then, okay, it's day 49, tomorrow they're gonna ripen. And that to me is, um, it's, it's an aggressive, it's really aggressive for the plant. It's really shocking. And you really don't ever wanna just shock the plants. I, I don't think going zero to 100 on anything is really smart when cultivating, especially at scale. Um, so transitionings be between these, these phases should take, should take a couple days, like three to five days. Um, small adjustments allow plants to keep their momentum, right? And so I kind of talk about growth velocity a lot, right? There's days where you come into your rooms and you're like, holy shit, like these things are clicking these things are growing they're putting on weight or they're stretch whatever it is the stack's great they've got a ton of velocity your job as a cultivator is to maintain that velocity and doing things hard and fast making big adjustments is how you destroy that velocity in the plant and then it takes a couple days to get that back or even a week um, i struggle with and a lot of people struggle with candies between weeks four and five kind of lulling out and not doing anything anybody anybody ever notice that too they kind of just like they're not stacking anymore, but they're not really bulking. They, they kind of just don't make that transition well. And it's good to just nail that as best as possible. Um, so we do small adjustments to keep that velocity up, keep that growth going. Um, yeah, big, big adjustments potentially stall growth. Um, okay, so I'm gonna give you guys an example so I can talk about this. <laughs> and this is what we just, we just went over. This is my bulk, and this is actually a little fast. This is my, like, our bulk, our middle weeks to our ripening weeks, okay? And what we're doing here is we're going from two P2 shots over a couple days, we're dropping to one P2, and then we're going no P2s, right? And this took me five days to signal to the plant, hey, it's, it's time to ripen, it's time to finish out. But you could have pulled both these P2s and like the next day could have looked like this very easily, right? You could just be like, okay, it's time to ripen, pull all the P2s. And that is very stressful for the plant. And it's going to take them a couple of days to understand what's going on. And you're going to kind of lose a few days. Losing one or two days here and there and there, you've lost a week. A week of growth is a lot when you're only at nine week growth, right? So maintain every single day you can. Um, and so this is something I'm working on and, and trying to like standardize this is very difficult. Um, especially at the scale we're growing at these days. Um, but I feel like it's easy to just look at your P2s, how many you have going into ripening and just pull this middle P2 off, right? L signify the plant, hey, you're about to dry back a little more and a little more and then give it to them. So take a couple days to make these adjustments is the best way to do it. Um, I do not have, I did not put an example in here for early generative to bulking. Um, <clears throat> so when we're in stage two, 
and we're generating that stack. There's gonna be a point at which they're no longer stretching, we have a great stack, and we need to start bulking them out. And what I'm doing with that is, and how I transition that, and I'm sorry I don't have an example, um, is basically every day, I'm landing the plants a little wetter at P0, and just a little wetter. Start, start day 20, they're starting, I'm starting to creep up on water content every morning. And that's basically signaling to the plant, hey, here's the water, here's the resources you need to support all that bud growth that you've just established. Like, here you go. And keeping the plants too dry for too long, you'll start to get, um, I call it small topping or triangle tops. You'll have this great stack, but only the top three nugs will actually like come together and it'll look like just like a triangle top. And oh, you had this great stack, but it's all these individual buds. And usually that means, you know, it was just too dry for too long. And so, so day 19, 20, I'm starting to like just tiptoe, right? Very lightly, a couple percent here and there. Instead of 20%, I'm 22%, and I'm 24%, and I'm 26%, right? I'm taking a few days to raise that. And then by day 25, to get to that, that higher water content in the morning, that higher P0, then you can start throwing on those P2s, right? And that'll really help. If you throw your P2s too early, you will get internode stretching at the top, right? So make sure you don't throw any P2s out there until your plants have like completely done stretching. It's very, very important. It's fine if you do it, you will still have great smoking weed, but you will kind of limit how much stack and how much yield you're gonna have. Does that make sense? Okay. Transitions is something that, I mean, I've been growing at scale for 10 years and transition, nailing transitions every single run on, I don't know, 75 different rooms, 60, 75 different rooms right now is very, very gnarly. But if you, if you have good protocol in place and you have good help in place, you can nail it, you know? And it starts with doing it once the right, like one time right and being like, oh, got it. And seeing your plants continue that growth velocity from stage one, stage two, stage three, and then to ripen, right? Continuing that growth velocity is really your main job as a cultivator. Like let the plant do its thing and help it along as best you can. Um, substrate sizing, I kind of touched on it earlier. A lot of people are growing in substrates that are too small, pots that are too small. It's really, really nice for root in. Your plants root in fast, they get going fast. You get control of them fast, but it really like, it, it really kills you in the end when you're trying to ripen, right? Or, or finish these plants out and you've got to keep giving them irrigations just to keep them wet in the morning. Cause if you only give them one event, one irrigation event, they're going to dry out to nothing the next day. So like it kind of, it kind of shoots yourself in the foot for the long run. Um, so just a little tip there. And then um, we're going to end on this and we'll go into under canopy um, after that. If you guys are still, if you guys still have time, I don't know what time it is. I may be too long. I had talked to you guys for an hour and 10 minutes already. That is wild. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> These are two triangles that I've been um, kind of using for a few years now. Um, and this is something that like, this is keep it simple. These are the ABCs of cultivation. And, and a lot of times when I walk through facilities, this triangle in particular is the one that's out of whack. And so your root health is shoot health, right? If you have busting healthy white roots, there's no bugs down there, there's no pythium, there's no molds, you've probably got a really robust, great plant. And that is a balance of water, food, and oxygen. Oxygen being the main one. Root health, er, root growth is directly related to how much oxygen the roots have access to. So when I see people where things get really weird, usually people can nail this early, but during bulking, everybody's sending all these P2 shots, your substrate is just saturated at all times and there's no time there's no room for oxygen to make, make its way make its way in right it's saturated it's completely filled it's at water it's at field capacity it's full of nutrients and soil there's not much room for oxygen and you'll get a slow dieback a slow browning of roots and so for that first week of transition i'm popping root i'm popping pots off root are uh, off the plants all the time just looking at roots and looking at roots and just making sure i've got those bright white noodles like i want really thick happy fishbone little just i mean i want some great roots all the way to the end
but I see a lot of people trip up during bulking when they're like, so-and-so company says I need eight P2 shots or whatever. And like they, I, I come in and I'm, all their roots are brown. And I'm like, well, there's no more, your roots are dead. They, they, don't, they don't turn white again. You know, you've oversaturated these. So like less is more, right? Less is more. So this is something that I swear, like if you can maintain this, if you can give it the right amount of food, right amount of food with the right amount of volume and maintain that oxygen percentage, you've got a bumper yield almost every time, okay? Troubleshoot that. Very, very easy triangle. And then this, especially for a lot of people sitting in this room with Ohio going rec, congratulations. Is it rec or medical? Yeah. It's rec rec. Oh, so you guys can just smoke weed. That's fine. That's right. That's the way it should be. Very cool. Very cool. Um, cultivation strategies, okay? There's all these new techniques. There's all these goobers talking about under canopy lighting. Those guys, you got to watch out for them. Um, there's crop steering. There's grow this way from that company. And no, 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 you should grow this way with hypochlorous acid and whatever from this company. There's all these new techniques, okay? Then we have traditional knowledge of like water the plant when it's dry, right? Old school irrigation of like just water, water it once a day and it's probably going to be good weed, right? We have traditional knowledge of like what quality was like before everything went legal. It was much, much better. Um, so we have our traditional knowledge. The guys like in here who've been growing for a long time and I can see it on your faces if you have. <laughs> a lot of stress there. And then we have market demand to meet. Right? We've got these purple goobers. Like everybody wants purple. Everybody wants candy. Everybody wants whatever. It is your job as a cultivator to maintain this balance. Okay? You, we've got these new techniques because we need yield now. Right? We can't hit one pound of light of chronic and sell it for 6000 It sucks. I wish we could. It was a great time. <laughs> but we can't do that anymore. We need yield. Right? We need to understand what this plant wants. But we also have to maintain the quality that we used to have in every batch you know and that's really the traditional knowledge and like what smokes you know a lot of this stuff right here doesn't translate to smokeability it does not so be careful and then the market demand which is the purple and the whatever okay it's it's your guys's job as cultivators and if you're growing for yourself maybe this doesn't matter as much right but if you're not and you're looking to do whatever and sell and not my not my business but that this is what you have to maintain um, anyway, that's my spiel on irrigation and just cultivation overall. Um, as I said in the intro, I am a founder of Faven Lighting, co-founder, um, this unit right here sitting in front of me. Um, I guess if you guys are running out of time, you can dip now if you guys are, but if you want to get into under canopy, I'll be a lot quicker. I swear. Let me jump into under canopy on that topic, right? So we have to have all this yield because to be honest with you, I've stayed in a cultivation role so long that I didn't really care. Like I knew if I was putting off enough yield and it was quality that we were making money. But recently in the last year, we've taken over a facility in Phoenix and it's vertically integrated. We've brought in a bunch of brands to the Phoenix market and we're in a partnership agreement. So I've got to be involved in every stage of the business. And something that is really eye popping is how much yield will determine your success. And it is the biggest driver of revenue. And while everybody here may love growing weed, you have to make money to be able to keep doing that. And yield is the only way. But you have to be able to maintain the quality as well. You can't just boof out these plants and get 10 pounds of light or whatever certain lighting manufacturers claimed. <laughs> Um, you can't get all this weight because if you sell it for cheap, it, you didn't make any money or like in California, we can't even sell it. You know, it gets to the point where you just burn it. Um, there's just so many producers. So under canopy lighting is kind of that, that unicorn that like you do not have to trail trade quality for yield, right? This is activating a previously underutilized area of the plant. This isn't, this isn't making bigger tops, boofing them out at the, at, at the tip top of your plant. This is just adding a whole other area. And everybody in here knows their square footage of their facility, right? Whether it's a 10 by 12 tent or you've got 10,000 square feet, you know every square foot. But what's your, what's your cubic canopy? What's your cubic foot, 
right? And your cubic foot is basically your square foot multiplied by the depth of your canopy, right? Most people are about two and a half feet deep on their canopy. With under canopy, you're looking to add another two feet of usable canopy. So right there, that thousand square foot room that had two and a half foot or two and a half feet of canopy, right? That cubic canopy was 2,500, right? Two and a half multiplied, you know, you know multiplied into a thousand will give you 2,500, right? Cubic feet of canopy. If you add under canopy lights to that existing space, you can add another 2,000 cubic feet of usable canopy. Does that make sense? I'm getting better at explaining this. It's, it's kind of tricky. <laughs> it's almost like a double stack or right. I used to actually call under canopies a double stack killer, to be honest with you. Right. And, just, and I know I kind of touched on it in the beginning, just to give you guys like my credentials in this. This isn't something that I was like, I'm just going to make freaking light and throw it under there. Like I did all the research and development for Alien Labs and connected in 2020 on intercanopy, inter under canopy, um, spectrum balancing, right? I've been doing this for about four years now. Um, and Faven just launched last year. Like it's been a long time coming and I worked for Connected for a year, did my own thing, worked with a bunch of other companies that had kind of under canopy products and then came into my now partner's office and kind of was just complaining about the lights on the market and how there was nothing on the market. And he just, he's a very straightforward guy and he's a very business oriented guy. And he looked up from his computer, looked at me and said, then make your own and stop complaining. And so literally that's how Faven was born. Like that day he was just, and he knew how to do that. Um, and so we started designing about two years ago and we just brought it to market in the last you know, seven months. Um, this is a very fleshed out design. But so I've been using this for a long time, right? This, is, this isn't something I just started doing. This is four years. Like this is a big portion of my actual cultivation career. And all you're really doing is you're adding yield capacity to your existing room. You know, it is extremely expensive to build out these days. It is way less expensive to add under canopies to that existing room and add that extra yield potential, right? And this isn't, this isn't my, these are not big numbers. These are not like things that I'm trying to pass along as BS. Like 25 to 35% yield increases is the standard for first time users. Like it is the absolute standard. And really, it's just because, like, where is the yield coming from? Like, look at this picture if it's not blurry on your screen. Like, do you see that is the bottom of a plant? Like, you see those nugs? Like, that, the, that specific row of, of that's, that's a genetic called red dragon. It's a great sativa we run in Cali for a lot of the, a lot of the, the white market. Um, th this run did 4.4 a light on a typical 5x5 five five spread of chronic, of light. And if you, like... I can show you the picture on my phone. It shows up better, but like that is chronic. That's the day before harvest and it is quality to the nines, right? That is absolute quality. Um, and so here's another side by side of that same genetic, right? You've got without under canopy on the left and you've got with under canopy on the right. And that's at week five. This is, these are separate rooms. One room had it, one room didn't. Like that is, I don't know how to say it any more than this picture, you know? And th again, this is quality. These nugs are dank like they're fully mature trichomes like you guys that do rosin in here you guys struggle with the lower half of your plants having good mature trichomes to make rosin make hash here you go breeders breeding right same thing with breeders and this is something i'm not a big breeding guy and i'm starting to learn but maturity of seeds in that lower canopy is a big deal right you want to try to get all this seed production from a single from however much square foot right you're getting mature you're getting mature seeds now right same thing with trike production and same thing with flower. Um, so at Faven, you know, we have Faven Lighting as our Instagram. We also have a YouTube channel. Um, and we're basically trying to put out as many resources as possible to make this transition as easy as possible for you guys. Um, and so we've got FAQs, we got IG guides, we have intro packets. Um, we have a bunch of, okay. <clears throat> So it was really important when we went to the design process to have dimmability for the under canopy units. And that's just because all the side-by-sides I did showed that turning them on at low wattage early on in flower did more than turning them on 100% later in flower. And kind of going back to what I said during the cultivation talk or the irrigation talk, 
Um, doing every, anything zero to 100 is not the way to move in cannabis. Like, it's just not. And so we started about 45 to 50% and we slowly increase intensity on the units up to 100% at the, at like the end of week three. So like day 18 to 21, you're getting to 100%, right? And you're keeping it there until the end of flower or you can, we'll get into it a little bit, but, but you can kind of dim towards the end of flower as well. But it's not a race to full power, slow and steady. Um, and the guys High Tech Detroit are fully built out with this. The guys at Grateful Farms. Um, we've got a bunch of guys in Michigan. There's actually the, the only place outside of California that there's more lights is, is Michigan. So um, Michigan's really messing with Faven right now, and I, I appreciate it. Um, so stop underclearing. How much time do you guys spend in your rooms underclearing? That's a lot of labor. And if you're a commercial guy, you know labor is going to kill you. <laughs> nice. <laughs> You know, labor is the hardest, the hardest thing to get away from. You have to have labor. So we're not underclearing anymore. We're cleaning up a little bit. We're, we're cleaning out any kind of like, I call it the cut leaves, right? The, the leaves that were on since cloning. And they're like the ones that you kind of trimmed up and cut. Removing those and we're strategic deleafing a little bit, but we're not underclearing like we were, right? We're utilizing the entirety of the plant. And because we're not underclearing, we're dropping plant count, right? So because you're adding more underneath and your lower canopy well you're going to kind of get a little congested down there so you can actually drop plant count to reduce that congestion and what that does is it prioritizes airflow down there and you're looking at every plant utilizing all that light to its entirety something that was kind of a side effect and for you those of you who are running commercial and you have climate sensors and all that we measure vpd one foot off our canopy right so we know what the top of our canopy is Temperature, humidity, VPD, CO2, we know all that. What's it on your under canopy? What's your lower canopy at? It's a lot wetter. It's a lot damper. It's a lot less airflow, right? It's a colder. So when you add light down there, you're actually evening out the VPD from the top of your plant to the bottom of your plant. So you have a more efficient plant, right? In, in, in agriculture and cultivation, you have plants have sources of energy and sinks of energy. Well, sinks of energy are all the things we used to underclear and take away, right? All those branches that never did anything, those were stealing energy. But now they are sources of energy because they have light on them, right? They are producing, they are photosynthesizing, they are making sugars to drive that process, right? So that's another way we're seeing more, um, more yield increase. So pruning, less is more. Day one through three, small cleanup of leaves that are blocking light and nodes that are kind of in the way of, of the lights. Um, and then I do a pro stretch cleanup to remove anything blocking, uh, like the upward mobility of the light. You want to make sure you're, you're getting a good mix of top and bottom light in the centers of your plant, right? If you can nail that, you're, you're honestly, you're going to be just blown away by the yield increase. Yeah. Usually, usually five to 700, you know, I'm like a thousand at the top, five to 700 in the middle. It's better than. I, I tape a I tape two together, oh, yeah. and I like stick it in the middle. Yeah. I'll know what I'm doing at the very top, and then I kind of want to know what the middle's doing. And usually the middle is about 700 on the top and about 500 on the bottom. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But like depending how big your plants are, yeah. all that matters, right? How far away it is from the light. Like if you put your if you put your meter right next to the light, it's gonna it's gonna bang up to 1200, you know, 12 or 2000. You know, it's it's an intense light, like. It's only 120 watts, but the way we've designed it, and we'll get into all this, like the way we designed it, as you guys can see, it bubbles out and it actually throws the light. And so diodes are tricky because if you're growing with LEDs, you know, like, it, like at the edge of that light, ed edge of that diode, there's no light right there. Like as soon as that diode ends, the light ends, right? <laughs> HPS, it's a big throw of light. So you can actually control the diode strength by putting optic lenses on it. And that's what we did. We put a diffused optic lens on this thing. So we'll get into that. Um, but no more lollipopping, no more skirting, nothing like that. We're strategic deleafing, right? We're increasing the upward penetration of light. Um, and we're just removing anything that kind of gets in our way. And leave all the branches, leave all the nodes. Like I tell people, if you want to clean up something, like this is I, the shaka, like this is as much as I clean up on my plants. Like that's it, like this length. Changes in irrigation, you're going to see, you're adding light, you're going to see an increase of water demand, right? You're adding wattage. Um, 
So increasing water consumption, um, this isn't entirely necessary, but we do see a fertilizer in need increase. Um, and that's really because you're adding, we see it more in HPS rooms that add these because you're adding LEDs to an HPS room, all right? And so that, that, that nutrient needs to come up a little bit. LED rooms that get under canopies put in, we see less of a need to increase that fertilizer because we've already run a little higher fertilizer because it's an LED room. Um, but something also we notice is liquid-based fertilizers. You're looking at like a 10% increase, like a, like a 0.2 to 0.3 increase on EC. Powder-based, much bigger, right? Because powder is just less available to the plant. It, just, it, just how, it, it is how it is. You're always feeding higher with a powder base than a liquid base. And I will say something, not related to under canopy or anything. If you're running liquid fertilizer, a lot of them shouldn't be ran above 3.0. Just keep that in mind. They weren't really like the feeding charts may say that they're they're available that they can, but like the liquid base, like they're highly they're they're more absorbable for the plant, so it's better to just keep it low and slow. I'll just say that. Um, powders you can kind of ramp up to whatever you want. Um, so because we're kind of congested down there, we're lowering plant count. And that really helps just optimize each plant. Like you're looking at pulling a lot more weight per plant. Um, uh, substrate sizing. Oh, this doesn't apply to everybody, but lowering plant count can sometimes need to the, lead to the need to increase substrate size. So kind of getting into like my last topic on irrigation where it was Everybody's growing in containers that are a little too small for them, but I understand why. Um, if you're in a container that's a little too small and you add under canopy to it, you're probably going to need to step up on size. And that'll just help you, it'll just help you maintain uh, the plant and irrigate correctly, really. Um, because you are going to see, like we said, about a 10 to 15% water demand increase throughout the day. So the Faven design. Um, and that is a super beautiful nug right there, like next to the base of the stem. Um, so I'll start with the bottom left. Put a wide body, <laughs> so it's wider. And that's really to promote a better throw in the under canopy. Um, we only suggest two rows of lights per bench. There's people out there that are talking three as many as you want and stacking them, whatever. People are getting really wild with it. But the design allows us to only have to run two, right? We've taken it so that we can, we put in this, this lens on it and we've given it this wide body to take up more space on the under canopy and throw the light this way instead of taking a top light, turning it upside down and it, calling it under canopy, which a lot of people, that's what a lot of people are doing. Um, this is, this is designed to throw the light into the canopy, right? Um, we have two different spectrums. We have a spectrum that kind of balances out the red, orange, and yellow of an HPS room. And then a spectrum that if you're running LEDs, most of them are about 40% red. And that lack of red really... In California, we have a problem because our consumer base is used to HPS weed. LED weed looks different. The goal is to make your LED weed look like HPS weed, and that is color, that is, uh, you know, how tight the bracts are and the nodes are, and the lack of red in LEDs up top is the really big driver of that. And so we took our LED spectrum and we added a ton of 660s and 680 diodes so you can really get that farther red and drive the color better with your plants and drive that, for lack of a better term, like cracked out bag look where you just open the bag and it looks like the weed you want to smoke, right? LEDs are tough um, from a color standpoint and um, from just the overall look standpoint. And like Michigan and California are very similar consumer bases where they're picky as hell because they're mature. They've been smoking weed a long time. So like Missouri, not a big issue. Out here, it's going to be an issue. Um, and then um, again, the purple, right? The, this farther red is really going to drive the purple production in your plants. Um, so we put a lens on our actual unit, and as you can see, it's diffused. So that comes from my greenhouse days, and, and we run um, double woven greenhouse plastic, and what that does is it takes the sunlight and evenly disperses it, so it lights up the entirety of the greenhouse. It's not just sun's over here to the south, right? 
and that's the side getting you know all the sun it takes it and really diffuses the light and lights up the entirety of the of the greenhouse so we took this approach as well because dio again diodes are very tricky and they need to they're very intense and then as soon as you get away from them they're they're not intense so this takes the intensity of the diode and spreads it out so you have a very even throw of light on your under canopy right there's a lot into that like this lens took us a long time um, and I'm very, very proud of it. Um, and then the bubble shape, we kind of already went over it. You can see how it bubbles out. Again, that's to control the diode intent. That's, it. that's to control the throw of light. If we wanted this to be pointed straight up, we would, we would make this almost a triangle. We would point this. But because we want it to throw, we rounded it out and really make it throw, right? And so you're getting about two feet in each direction is what I, what I kind of go off of, two feet. So... Whether your benches are four feet wide or five feet wide, two rows of lights is really all you need. I've got some of the best growers in Northern California running these now, and um, some of them are four plants wide, some of them are three plants wide, some of them are, you know, different tables, the tables with the, you know, the trenches in the middle, whatever. I always just recommend two wide. It's all you need. On the um, sides of it? On the outsides of the benches? Running actually in between your plants. Okay. So actually, here's a spot right here. Here's a picture right here. Yeah. So yeah, they're underneath and um, I'm a three plants wide guy. So you've got plant, light, plant, light, plant. Very simple. Um, IP66 waterproof rating, five year warranty. They're auto sensing voltage. So 120, 240, 277. So whether you're at home with a tent or you're in a, you know, a 200,000 square foot commercial facility, we've got what you need. Um, they hook right into Trollmasters, right? If you got a line open on your Trollmaster, they pop right in. You control dimmability, on, off, everything. It's very, very easy integration. Um, and then I threw this on there as created by growers. It's so cliche. <laughs> like, it's so cliche. But, like, this really was a light built out of the necessity to, like, give other growers a good under canopy light and a light that can handle commercial cultivation and the rigors of commercial cultivation. Um, and, you know, I... This design is, is mine and my engineering team's design. This isn't, this isn't like some big conglomerate. This isn't Hawthorne. This isn't, and like, no, dis, this isn't a disrespect to anybody, but this isn't a big guy like, you know, supporting Fave and you're supporting just, just good core growers who have been in it for a long time, right? Um, and my business partner has been in hydro for 15 years and um, you know, he understands how to run a really good company and how to build a company and how to maintain a, a good customer base and make sure your customers are happy. So, you know, we really understand and, and Faven's position to be here for a long time. You know, it's, we may be the new kid on the block, but, you know, we're based in a ton of cultivation research and a ton of um, just background on how to run a good business. Um, so I just want to say that. It's, again, it's, it's hard to take a, a chance when you guys are spending so much money on lighting and pots and soil and fertilizer but you know we're built to last we're not going to be here for just you know a couple years and then disappear um how do you get started with faven you visit <laughs> favenlighting.com visit our instagram hit us up it's the best way we'll send you a lighting layout and what we do is you send us some benching specs we'll build you out what your layout's, layout's going to look like and we give you an implementation plan of like how to go about it you know we're not just like okay hey thanks for the money bye like it's like we're here to really make sure your first experience with Under Canopy and your first experience with Faven is a good one. Right? We really, really want you guys to be successful. And to be honest, 90% of people have a one run return on investment. Like the yield, is, the yield increase is so good and because we're able to really help people with their implementation, you, you buy a set of lights, you pay it off in one run and then you got them forever. You know, in a five year warranty that we back up fully. If there's an issue, hit us up, we'll send you a new one. DTE, so we just started messing with DTE. My application is in as of last week, but we're looking at a 40% rebate on DTE, which is killer. Yeah, and I'm like, like, sweet, okay. So that was like the first one around the country. Again, I'm just a grower from Sacramento. I'm learning all this on the fly, you know? That's in Michigan, like the discounts of buying, you know, thousands of lights. Makes a big difference, oh yeah. And so I'm, I just got kind of clued into the rebate game and a lot of like big guys play the rebate game heavy and I've got to compete with that, which I'm like, damn, another thing to do. <laughs> I can grow weed all day, man, but this is brand new to me, so I'm learning. But, you know, the design is there. I can, I can teach growers all day. 
dude, yeah, I've gotten a few in Cali and they're really nice. They're nice and plump. Um, and so I'm very much learning how to build a company at the moment, but at the very core of it is making sure consumers have a good experience with Faven. And um, I've been in the industry a long time. I'm going to be in the industry a long time. I'm not doing anything else. So if Faven fails, it's going to be tied to Tim. It's going to be tied to Bobby Bags. It's going to be like, I'm going to be an asshole if I don't do this right. So, and that's something I don't want. Go ahead, guys. So, um, yes. What's that? No. Yes. Yes, of course. Um, Alex Mango won't give me any of his ICLs to test out and do side by side, but I would, yeah, he won't give me any. He's sold all his pre-order. He's like five minutes away from me in Sacramento. Like I see him once or twice a week, you know, it's all love there. Um, but the thing with Mango is he's, he's doing his trials right now and selling the lights that he's trialing on. He's never completed a full flower run with those lights. He has no idea what the flower is going to be. And like, yeah, you put light in the canopy, it's going to work. But what are we doing with that extra yield? Well, Faven's geared for quality. That's why we have the diffused lens. That's why we have, you know, that's why we took time to pick out the spectrum and, and took our time. Like, we've been designing this light for a while. We didn't like, hey, guys, we're going to put out an intercanopy light. It's the best ever we're also going to go through like four versions before we get the perfect one for you. Like, please buy them in the meantime. Like it, it's kind of funky, right? And no disrespect to Alex, but it is what it is. And you know? you're going to use less of those if you're going to use something else. Yeah, pretty much, you know? And then uh, Kraft, um, haven't tested his new V3, but again, he's, he's on version three. Why is he on version three? He, he hasn't done the R&D. Like, I did the inter-canopy, under-canopy trials four okay. years ago. I looked at the spectrums. I've done all this before. The only reason why it took this long to get this to market was because I didn't have manufacturing power. Again, I'm just a grower. I had no idea this was gonna happen. And I just happened to find the right partner. Um, and then also we wanted it to be perfect. We weren't gonna drop this and get this in the hands of great cultivators just to have it be like, oh my bad, there's a better one. Like, well, you know, like, sorry you spent your money with us. Here, you should buy this one now, you know? So it was very much like we wanted to hit it right the first time, but these guys are going to go through their versions. This is our version, and we're going to refine this as we go, but this is pretty damn good. You know, I'm not going to say there won't be another iteration down the road, but we've, we've done it. Yeah, yeah. But good question. It's fair, and everybody's coming in. Everybody's like, okay, and under canopy works, and I'm like, yeah, and then I look at these designs, or I look how fragile they are, like, come, like, this is a lightsaber, like, come hold this thing, like, this is a real unit that isn't gonna just fall apart on you, like, this thing's solid, shake it, you know, like, we, <laughs> like, I joke, but, like, you really could have lightsaber wars with it, um, so anyway, um, I appreciate the conversation, like, I appreciate the question, and uh, cannabis is too small to kind of rain on anybody's parade. Like, I know all those guys, they're all in Northern California. Like I said, Mango is like right around the corner from where we store all these. Like, I could probably throw a ball and hit his facility. Um, and it's great, but these guys just haven't done the R&D that I have. They just haven't, like straight up. And on the topic of intercanopy, I think it's great. And when I was at Connected, everybody had their money on intercanopy beating out under canopy because it makes more sense, right? You're like, the light's right there, it's perfect. Intercanopy never hit the yield potential, anywhere near the yield potential of undercanopy because you're leaving out the bottom third of the plant. And while Alex is putting diodes in the corner and doing what he's doing, he's still leaving out the bottom third of the plant, right? And then there's, so you've got yield potential that not even close, right, between the two. And then in commercial settings, like workflow is king. Like you can't bring a product into somebody's, uh, facility and be like, hey, you're going to get 25% more yield, but all of your workflows are completely screwed, right? So when you do inner canopy, like how high do you place them? Okay. Do you place them between the first trellis or the second trellis? Okay. That plant stretched a little more. Okay. So I have to raise this thing up now. Like I have a trellis in the way or okay, right on. Also, if you put light in the middle of your canopy, what are the leaves going to do? They're going to just populate this whole they're gonna suck into it. So it's actually a pretty poor placement for the plants. Like, it's great placement for the plants, poor placement for the cultivator, right? So if this can achieve more on yield and maintain workflow and not really cause any interruptions, this wins out 10 out of 10 times. Do you find the, the foliage to grow downwards now versus upwards? 
So you'll get, I call it, uh, do I have a picture in here? I don't think so. I call it ram's horn. It kind of looks like nitrogen toxicity where the, where the, the leaves curl downwards to put, you know, put their photosynthetic cells towards, you know, the light and that's it. It just kind of, they hook down and it's, it's not deficiency. It's not anything. It's just them curling down towards it. And, you know, first time we saw it, we kind of freaked out and then we got a yield back that was just insane. And we were like, yeah, because they don't really photosynthesize on the bottom. But what we're doing is we're throwing a ton of light, a directed beam of light into the canopy. Well, what's it doing? It's just ping ponging around until it finds a photosynthetic cell. Like it's just finding its way in. Right. And while that seems like inefficient, it's better than sticking the light right on top of them. A very intense light right on top of them, I may add, with most people aren't diffused. A very intense light and letting the foliage just consume it. And then you're in there deleafing more. Our idea is to reduce labor. You're increasing your labor with intracanopy. Right. Right. And again, adding labor to your existing facility, that's just a cost, man. Labor is, and finding good labor. I had a conversation last night with a bunch of Michigan guys and like, we cannot find good labor. And I'm like, same, you know what I mean? It's just tough. So like finding people. So like the simplest solution is often the best solution. And that is, yeah. But anyway, um, it's a good question. And like, there's gonna be a ton of competitors coming out and it's great, it's fine. Like, it's gonna legitimize under canopy because right now I still seem kind of gimmicky until people like turn a light on under their plant and they're like, oh damn, this like, it, once you see it applied for a week or two, like you don't even have to do a full run, but you're like, oh, this makes way more sense, you know? Um, and I tell everybody, if you're, if you're hesitant, if you're nervous or you're strapped, you're low on funds, which all of us cultivators are, start with one bench. Just start with a bench. Like there's no reason to like spec out a whole room. There's no reason to like do the cost on your facility, like whatever. Start with a bench because one bench is going to teach you how to apply it to a full room and one room is going to teach you how to apply it to your facility. And the cost will roll itself, right? I got cultivators that get one trial bench and that yield increase pays for the rest of the room. You know, like this ROI is real. You know, it's a single run ROI 90% of the time. Um, and so that's something that we just don't have in cannabis. So not only does it maintain workflow, but the ROI is there. Like it doesn't add any extra, you know, BS. You're looking at a little more volume of water and, you know, some adjusting of food inputs and maintaining environments, really. That's it. So you have to run Unistra across your whole table. No, I'm just playing. Um, so we have legs coming. Right now we're just taking hard pots, turning them upside down, putting them up there. And like you're really looking at the lowest point of the light you want to have is like the base of the light. The base of the light. Uh, this is a bad example, but we're going to use it. So this is your pot. Your base of your light needs to be, like at the lowest setting, can be flush with the top of your pot, okay? And that's just because we don't want to waste blasting light at the pot. We don't want to warm up the substrate, right? We don't want to blast light at the substrate. That's not a good idea. Um, yeah, dude, you're just like, it's not good. But also, algae is really growing down there because it's stagnant too. So dropping plant count, adding light, we're actually seeing less algae grow on top of rock wool, which I know you would have thought would just like go crazy, but we're actually seeing less algae. We're seeing less PM. We're, only, we're not seeing less PM because of under canopy lighting, we're seeing it because there's no more microclimate from the top to the bottom of the plant, right? It's even, yeah. And then I, I kind of mentioned it earlier, I used to call them double stack killers, and then we put them on double stacks. And those numbers are really wild. Um, and they, they really work. We actually messed with a couple different wattages as well, like 80s and, one, and 100s, because these are 120 watt. And it, we still ended up at a 120 watt, so anyway. Um, yeah. What kind of numbers did those double stacks find? We had a very medium yielding plant um, do 95 grams a square foot on both tier. So if you're looking at your square foot, that's 190 grams a square foot of like floor space. Yeah. We just had the biggest double tier in Sacramento, um, order three worms worth. And, 
you know, high text messing with us out here. If you guys know Anna from Cam, she's in eight states. She's a big Sacramento uh, producer. She's building out with us. Bear Cannabis, if you guys follow him on Instagram, he's an absolute slayer. Some of the one of the best cultivators. He's building out with us. You know, we have a lot of big players on our team now, and it's not, you know, once you once you see it once, it's all you need.